Hi there, come on in. It is Thursday night, December 28th, the year 2000. I'm Fred Trost, and this show is called The Practical Sportsman. But what does that mean? What is this show all about? What's been going on the last 20 years I've been on the air versus the year 2001? Well, I'm gonna borrow a page from the Sesame Street book. Uh, this show is brought to you by the letters I, P, and F, and by the number one. What's that all about? Hey, I'll explain. Stay tuned. Now, this next half hour is going to be different, but hang on. You're going to find out during this half hour if you are the kind of viewer that wants to watch the kind of show that I'm going to be producing in the coming year. Now, I told you that this show is brought to you by I, P, and F, uh, and the number one. Now, what is this about? Well, I is a big theme in this. It stands for Individual Independence. That, to me, is what the outdoors is, is so much about, is so attractive. The fact that you can do it by yourself, make your own decisions, call your shots, uh, fish where you want, fish the way you want. That freedom is very important. Ah, an F word, also brought to you by F. The freedom to have fun. That's extremely important. It always has been since I was a kid in the outdoors. But I found that in recent years, this freedom has been has been sort of sucked out of different aspects of hunting and fishing. Well, where does this come from? Well, this is where our letter P comes in. The problem that I've seen with the outdoors, especially in the past decade, boils down, if, if you can use a couple words, it would be political power. The outdoors hunting and fishing has become so political, and that has really taken the freedom and the fun out of what used to be very relaxing activities for individuals. So my goal on this television show is to try to teach you how to have fun and find freedom in the face of the politics of the times, because I don't see that changing for the next few years at least. Now I'm going to go through various aspects of things that I've had on the show and that I'm going to have on the show and some things I'm not going to have on the show anymore. But let's, let's start off with one uh, that was very popular back in the 80s when I started, 1981, recipes. Fish and game recipes. Well, wh why did I have that on the show? Well, recipes embody the individuality and creativity and the freedom of making things that are just full of F words. Food, family, friends, fun. <laughs> it, recipes are just awesome. It's something we have to eat every day. And there's a lot of freedom in recipes too. Unless, you know, you're not going to get a ticket for it by anybody. The DNR is not going to come out and raid your kitchen. Unless, of course, uh, you want to have eggplant and eagle casserole or maybe uh, jambalaya with jack pine warbler. You know, anything short of that, you're not going to be hassled on, and it'll be fun. You can do it with friends. So that's extremely important. That's why I have come back to putting recipes on the air, and I will be expanding this in the coming year. Now, there's another thing. Speaking of, of political uh, politically incorrect. Many things in the outdoors have become politically incorrect. Collecting, you know, collecting outdoor items, sporting items, whether it's mounts like you see over my shoulder here, or artifacts or equipment has become in the rage. I have been collecting outdoor things and just loving it, but I especially love the politically incorrect outdoor things. I, uh, I have one right here. It's a hair dryer. In fact, uh, let me introduce you to Mike Stewart, who's going to be a regular on the collecting segment. He's a weapons expert, a custom knife maker. Uh, he's not really a collector. He's not bit by the collecting bug like I am, but I got a big kick out of handing this to him and seeing what his reaction was. I actually um, have seen one of these before. Really? Yes. And um, it may be politically un uh, incorrect, but in actuality, it, it looks like something that would be a really nice joke for somebody. And it certainly would make a gift, a great gift for a, one of those men who are difficult to buy for, me being one of them, because most of us just go out and get what we want. We don't express ourselves well as to what we want for gifts. But my only problem with this is I have a very hard time pointing something like this at my head. <laughs> So I'm not sure I'd be real secure. It's, it's not good practice for anything. 
uh -huh. that you'd do more than once, uh -huh. see. But I think it's cute, and I think that uh, there's no harm in it. And uh, this would be very difficult, I would think, even to hold up a liquor store with. In fact, uh, what are the, uh, it says, warning, trigger must be depressed to release hammer switch. Well, that's kind of like a gun. That's, there's off. I don't want to break this because it's such high quality. Uh -huh. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah, I see it now. You, you pull the trigger, cock the hammer, and aim it at your head. Right. You, <coughs> you pull the trigger, cock the hammer, and aim it at your head. Um, I really would take a pass on using this, but I see no harm in things like this. I, I think that they're great gag and uh, joke things. Uh, I think that people today are getting much too sensitive about inanimate objects somehow being tr intrinsically evil. There's nothing evil about any inanimate object. Um, guns by themselves do no harm. It, it's the person that has it in their hand. And I don't think that this is uh, even that politically incorrect for most of us. I think that there's a, a small fringe of people who think that anything shaped like a gun is evil. Um, I also would not recommend children taking this to school, though. It's really too bad that that's no joke. I mean, when Mike Stewart says you wouldn't recommend a kid taking this to school, no kidding. There have been kids kicked out of school recently for pointing their fingers like a gun at each other and saying bang, bang for drawing a picture of a gun. I mean, what is going on with this world? It isn't just political power. It's this power of political incorrectness that is, uh, it, it seems to just permeate sportsmen's activities, hunting, fishing, the shooting sports. Uh, in fact, the things I have on this table are part of the things that I've been collecting for the museum here, and these are all things that could get kids tossed out of school, I'm sure, if they took them to school. For example, this, this little cap gun, I'm sure, is enough to bring the wrath of a school administrator down on a little kid. This is something that, can, that you cock it and can actually put a little cap in there. Uh, back in the old days, when I was a kid, they made caps for things like this. But that's pretty neat. Uh, another thing that I enjoy collecting uh, is little pistols. I mean, these are really regarded as politically incorrect, and this also is a cap gun that actually works, I guess, if you could find caps to it. Look at this. Probably would be looked upon with disdain nowadays, what with the uh, drinking and driving uh, stigma. Of course, that's a well deserved stigma, but this is a shot glass, says Big Shot on it, and furthermore, it's in the shape of a shotgun shell. But I just had to have that. I think that is cool. And oh, take a look at this. Oh, I'm sure this is a big no-no in a lot of households because it actually shoots. It's a clothespin, a dowel, and a handle. This was not a manufactured toy. Somebody made this, obviously, for a kid. But you put a rubber band in the clothespin there, and then you just squeeze the clothespin, bing, <laughs> there it goes. Well, it shoots a projectile. I mean, to some people, this is just sinister and terrible. But I tell you, I grew up with guns like this, cap guns, toy guns. My friends did. We didn't have problems at school. We didn't even think that there was anything uh, sinister about it at all. It's kind of tragic that that's what we have nowadays. But on a television show like this, I promote collecting, collecting things like this. I also promote the shooting sports, and that's very important to me to do this because I find the I and the F words uh, very important in this, the independence and the individualism of it. Shooting sports generally is not team competition, it's individuals. It involves the freedom and the fun to go out there and use guns in a situation on a registered shooting range in a way that is safe, that is, involves a lot of camaraderie, your family is involved, your friends. Uh, the, it, it's just so much fun to recreationally shoot. And this is not a part of most television shows. Most people stay away from shooting that are in the media because it's, it's just bad to promote, they say. Well, I totally disagree. I think that that needs to be promoted because it's personally important to me. Not only collecting things about guns and hunting and fishing, but actually getting out there and doing it. That's the key. That's the real key to having fun outdoors, is not just talking about it, not just watching it, not just reading about it, but actually getting out there and doing it. 
There's another area that I have found to be fun outdoors that I highly recommend that you get involved with in some way. That is RVing. Now, you don't have to go out and buy an expensive RV. You can get a used one. You can get uh, some really economical deals. But the reason I promote it is I have found it's added to my fun outdoors. The, the F words, fun, freedom, family and friends, they've all been involved and it's just been a total riot. It also has the independence that a lot of activities don't. You don't have to make a reservation, be at a certain place at a certain time, you can travel. That freedom is something that is hard to get nowadays with the government control that seems to be getting more and more. And I know I'm pounding on this government control, but it's gotten to be a real serious problem. What about the DNR? I'm not going to go into a harangue right now on it, but I am going to show you something that I think was the most colossal disappointment that I've seen in the last 20 years of doing outdoor television. That is a sportsman's group that seemed to be a grassroots effort came up and was going to actually make a change in the DNR, make a change in government. This group found out how difficult that is and giving the political power and political climate of the times, White Tails Forever ran into a roadblock. This is a sad chapter, I think, in Michigan sportsman history. But I want to review this for you and show you what I started promoting one year ago on this show, almost down to the week of this White Tails Forever movement. I do that one guy who said, uh, we're the people of managed to do, not the DNR. Well, we are. You know, uh, like I told him, somewhat we are. <laughs> that's the sad thing about what's going on right now. We're forming another organization. You got Western Michigan Quality Deer Management. I mean, that's pretty sad when we have to go out as ourselves and do that because the DNR will not listen to us. This is a statewide thing. I think it's pretty sorry that this has to be done. But we're trying to do it. Organizations come and organizations go. I've seen a parade of them. And a year ago, I thought, hey, this isn't going to go anywhere different than any other sportsman's organization that talks, talks, talks and never accomplishes a thing. And when I say doesn't accomplish anything, changes aren't made. Well, the White Tails Forever group vowed to make changes. They vowed to find a way to make the DNR become responsive to the problems that sportsmen see throughout the state. Now, this didn't exist a year ago, but they had a plan on how they could make that change. Our objective right now is to develop a statewide organization to inform and educate state representatives and senators of the need to change the Administrative Procedures Act and to obtain their commitment to do so. They do not have to give us any input and report to us. They will not even listen to us. It doesn't do us any good anymore. We have to change legislation. That's why our commitment is to go statewide on this. They have stepped over the line on their antlerless deer permits and their, antler, their extended antlerless deer season. That is DNR management, and they need to listen to us. We have to change this right here. That is our goal. Randy Smith made it pretty clear last December what White Tails Forever was all about, what they were setting out to do, make a change in the way the DNR makes their regulations that would require them to give notice in advance and, and actually consider the input of sportsmen. Well, I was kind of pessimistic at the beginning, thinking, ah, they're not going to really carry through with it. But they were serious. They put together a petition that was very specific and got sportsmen all over the state to sign this. And I helped promote that. If you remember that petition that I put on the air a year ago, they are circulating petitions right now and making these available all around the state. And this is what the petition says at the top. Whereas farmers, sportsmen, and citizens of Michigan are very concerned about our dwindling deer herd due to the extended antlerless deer season and unlimited antlerless deer permits authorized by an order of the Natural Resources Commission, and whereas individual hunters and sportsmen's groups have tried to work with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources in the past but have found at best limited success, and whereas 
The Michigan State Legislature has exempted the DNR from the rulemaking procedures required by the Administrative Procedures Act for sport hunting and sport fishing regulations, which allows the DNR Commission to issue orders on a 30-day notice without formal public hearings and sufficient due process of law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the undersigned hereby petition the Michigan State Legislature to delete subsection 207D from MCLA 24.207, which would require the DNR to promulgate sport fishing and sport hunting regulations under the rulemaking process established for state agencies under the Administrative Procedures Act. Should the legislature fail to require the DNR to conform with APA rulemaking procedures, it is the intention of Whitetails Forever to pursue a ballot initiative to put this issue before the voters of the state. That's the petition as it's being circulated. If you want more information about this grassroots effort, Call Randy movement, that petition sounded perfect to me, really clear. I was excited. I thought, man, they're going to follow through on this. Well, as time went on, the talk was there. The rhetoric was there. Richard Heathcock was one of the founders of Whitetails Forever, and uh, he gave many inspirational speeches to the troops about what they were going to have to do to carry this to a referendum. Uh, I don't know if you folks have ever had the occasion to get in this kind of um, a situation before. The state legislature, the representatives and senators are extremely busy people. It's very difficult to get their attention, much less their time to listen to us. If, if we fail to get some action by the state legislature and we go for a referendum, uh, that's a lot of work to go out and get the, the signatures that we need in order to get it on a ballot. And there's going to be some controversy, I'm sure, before it's over. But this is what democracy is all about. This is a grassroots movement. And I think from the reaction and number of signatures that I've seen on some of the petitions and the folks that I've talked to, it's doable. But it's going to take a statewide effort to do it. And each one of you know folks in other counties, you need to talk it up, and we'll go out and help them form chapters of this effort, whatever it takes whatever it takes, but it's going to take you folks out there to make it happen. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Those words still ring in my ears one year later. Uh, I mean, it's a sad thing that the Whitetails Forever grassroots effort did not pull together to do whatever it takes. Well, they took a few steps. In fact, I helped them testify at a legislative hearing last spring where Whitetails Forever explained their position and asked the Senate Hunting, Fishing, and Forestry Committee to act. I asked them to clip back the power the legislature has really unconstitutionally given the DNR. And what was the result? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not by the legislature, not by that legislative committee. And do you know why the legislature didn't act? because they don't understand the problem, let alone the solution. They don't understand the Administrative Procedures Act. In fact, most of them don't even know what it is. And why not? Well, this might come as a shock because I was a big proponent of term limits. I was a big proponent of getting these rascals out, these, these legislators who were making a career out of legislation. I didn't realize how important and valuable that was to the legislative process and the voice of the people. What we have now is a whole legislature full of new, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed legislators who unfortunately don't have a clue as to how government works, how the legislature is supposed to work, how it's supposed to stand up to the executive branch. And because they don't have the experience or the knowledge, what do they do? They ask the DNR what they're supposed to do. Consequently, Whitetails Forever came up dry with the legislature. Their goal was not fulfilled. Why didn't they move to the petition drive they vowed to do? Because Randy Smith told me a few months ago, he says, hey, we put that petition drive on the back burner. I said, why? He says there was just too much opposition from the DNR and from other sportsmen saying it would open a can of worms or whatever. Uh, that is very disappointing. I, I hate to change the story now for the 3,000 people who showed up in Ithaca last January to show their support for a change. One year later, my message to them is that apparently change is not in the cards anytime soon. 
But I am not pessimistic about change. It is coming. It just isn't coming now. And it's not going to come through these, quote, grassroots efforts. They're not working. The executive branch and the political power is just too great. It steamrolls, whitetails forever. Steamrolls, it's seemingly anybody who stands in the way. But this is not going to last. Now, writing your legislator, uh, calling them up, going to DNR meetings, going to club meetings and beefing and complaining, all that's going to do is take away from your fun in the outdoors for the time being. Change is imminent, though. You've seen it in the news. With the dot-coms down, the economy going on a downturn, maybe even a recession, for all the negatives of that, it's going to have a positive effect on the voice of the people in the legislature. I think this will result into, in a reversal of the term limits. I think people are going to need legislators with experience to handle things, to become stronger. I think we're going to lose faith in the executive branch to set its own regulations and run itself. The season will be coming economically that will force these political changes. In the meantime, the good side is you can focus on having fun. Remember I told you this show was brought to you by I, P, and F. Well, the F words, <laughs> believe it or not, are the most important here. And here's the F lesson for today. Have faith that the future will force change. I mean, the recession's going to take care of that. And while we wait for that to happen, focus on having fun with family and friends. Focus on those outdoor activities where there's freedom to have fun. That's really the key. You know, all this talk about baiting and baiting regulations is not about baiting itself. It's about the freedom to choose how you want to hunt. Uh, the fuss about DNR officers coming onto your property, searching and so on. That isn't about enforcing law and law enforcement. That's about the freedom to enjoy your personal private property rights. Now, I also mentioned, of course, this is brought to you by the letter I, which is for the individual. That's who this show is for. If you're a group type person, you're into grassroots movements and all that, you're not going to like what I talk about on TV because I say I don't care about that right now. It isn't going to work. I care about the individual. You as an individual, you can do more to help your family learn how to have fun uh, than any group or club or government is going to do for you. And once again, brought to you by number one. You know who the number one is? Number one is you. If the recession hits coming up soon, which it probably will, look out for number one. Look out for yourself. And you not only have to do that financially, but do that in your recreation as well. That's what The Practical Sportsman is about. I'm going to show you how to cope with these things in the future. Simple ways of hunting and fishing. Not spending a lot of money on technology, going back to the simplicity of the outdoors and enjoying the outdoors. Well, that's it. I know this show was a big lecture on this, but it's very important that you understand where I'm coming from where you, so you can understand what this show is going to be about during the coming year. Number one is what it's all about. Uh, just as I've said, things aren't always as they seem. The hunting and fishing wards, our Marbles Hunting and Fishing wards, really aren't about the deer and the fish. Mm -mm. They're about the people and the stories. That's where the fun is. So I'll see you back here next week, I hope, unless you decide that uh, my type of message isn't what you want. But if you do, uh, enjoy yourself this weekend. I'll see you next weekend. Listen to this trophy story on the way out. This is Josh Schneider from Lansing. He got this buck in Eaton County, and he was bow hunting. Got it on the 13th of November, just before gun season, after school. You're in school? Yep, yep. How old are you? 15. So you've only been hunting a few years. Yeah, I was 14 when I got this buck. Oh, really? First first buck with my bow. 40-pound bow. Uh, recurve or compound? Compound. Awesome. Do you practice a lot? I started after I missed quite a few times. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, how whatever it takes. That's right. Now, being a 15-year-old now, what it, why do you like to hunt? Just being outside, getting cold, staying out there. Fighting it off, you know. Oh, yeah, because you're tough. That's right. You play football? Yes, I do. You wrestle? No. No wrestling. Hockey? No. No hockey? No hockey. Okay, but you're <laughs> tough, and you, and you like that challenge of it then. Yeah, it's staying out there, getting cold, and then trying to stay out there, you know. Now, now does anybody in your family hunt? My dad. And do you like to, like, maybe get a bigger buck than him? This, uh, this top, all of his deer. <laughs>
So at your age, is that part of the fun, too? That's right. <laughs> well, very good. Josh Schneider from Lansing, you're the man. Congratulations.